All right. So today we're going to be talking about intentional relationships. I know the title of my talk could have been probably been a little bit better. Uh, we're talking about 30 minutes a week, and that's what we're going to boil it down to. Um, but the, the purpose is going to be intentional relationships. So a little bit about me, for those of you who don't mean, I am a VP here at consulting um, or VP of consulting and improving here in Houston, Texas. Um, Christian, I come from a technologist background. So I've been a developer most of my career, uh, improver and a lifelong learner, which is synonymous in my head. But that's just the two seconds about me. Um, and what I'm going to start with is what does it mean to have a relationship with somebody? Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read this book, um, I would highly recommend it. Um, it. It walks you through kind of who you know, what it means to network, and um, breaks kind of some of the, the stories that we tell ourselves when it comes to uh, whether or not people are actually available for you. The, the concept is, is that you know the people that you need to know today for the thing that you want to do in your life. Like if you have a big, hairy, audacious dream, the people you know are going to help you make that happen are already in your life is, is the fundamental concept there. And what they do is they have these circles that um, you start with intimacy, which is going to be your closest circle. That's going to be your number one, who's generally a spouse, a parent, a sibling, maybe a best friend. Uh, then you have your top three. Those are the people who uh, you call when you're in trouble. Let's say you had a car wreck and your spouse isn't available. Who's the next person on that dial tone? Who's that person that you really don't have secrets with, you share values with, you're open and honest, you feel like you pull your guard completely down. Um, and then you end up in the friendship category. You're, you're now talking about probably about 12 people-ish uh, as a rule of thumb. Those people are um, those you would invite over for a game night. You're going to have a Mardi Gras party. You're going to invite them to go to this thing. Uh, they're in kind of your close-ish circle. They could be coworkers, family, friends, whatever that is. Then there's kind of the participation circle. The people that you're close, close to in your life or you're familiar with at a high level because there's a high level of participation. Coworkers that you're not really close with often fall in this category that you have to work closely with. Um, people, let's say you're on a sports team or you're in networking events or you're part of uh, Houston Rodeo, putting that together. Uh, generally, this is influenced highly by frequency of contact. And then there's your exchange category, the, the people that you only see once in a while because you run the similar circles. Um, conference groups might fall into this, people in your network. There could be 100 people in this category or more, depending on how much you network. Now, the interesting thing about these circles is what I want you to think about is Start imagining who you would put in those circles about how many people would you end up with, what that looks like. And once you have that in your head, think about what that would have looked like two years ago. Now, if you're like me, you might have some people that moved from participation to friendship because you decided that they were going to be in your like quarantine pod, maybe. You maybe have some intimacy people that moved out into participation because you ended up with, with conflicts that you couldn't resolve. And maybe you had an entire exchange group that fell off the map in your network. It's, it's undeniable that COVID changed this in some way. And we see that show up in our workplace in big, big ways. I pulled a bunch of stats on what impacted that did and how that has shown up from different stats that I found all over the online, including the Harvard Business Journal and a few others. And there, they say a lot. Job security is down, income's down, workloads increase, social relationships are down by 60% of people say this. Sense of control has declined, loneliness has increased, people are depressed. And it hasn't been all bad, right? There has been positives. There have been people who have been able to get more control over their time because they're not commuting to work. There are people that feel like they've been able to reassess where their career is and those types of things. But the question is, is are we are we saying, OK, we'll accept the way we, where we are now because it's the world we live in? Or are we choosing that for ourselves? And what I want to bring this all down to is the intentionality be behind recreating the things that made relationships convenient. 
Because the reason our circles changed is because it became it no longer was convenient to talk to those people. It was no longer convenient to build those one-off friends. It wasn't easy to just go to a bar and meet more people there. And it, and it was hard to even say, okay, well, this person's a high risk and maybe you haven't seen them in two years. And so what do you do? How do you, how do you manage that? And then beyond that, for us who are leaders in organizations, how do you create this environment where your culture is still strong, where your employees are getting to know each other and where you're continuing to learn and grow. We've all heard about this great resignation where people are dropping off the map left and right from different companies. And I think fundamentally it has to do with the fact that people feel disconnected from the people they work with, feel disconnected from uh, their environments. So how do you keep them engaged? Now, I wish I could say, that we saw all of this coming and happened to implement a program that counteracted it, but it was actually a little bit of a stroke of luck that we implemented a program where we asked all of our employees to spend 30 minutes a week, every single week, meeting with a small group of other employees to talk about trust. Now, if you look at improving.com, you'll see trust is a big deal. We have a trust initiative internally, and it's a huge focus of culture in our organization. But what this did is it, is it said, hey, let's talk about what the hard things that are happening. Let's talk about the challenges with the clients. Let's talk about the things that are important to you. And what it did is it built relationships. And so we created this foundation for people to feel like on a personal level, they were still engaged. And it ended up being crazy, crazy powerful. So if you're looking at me and you're like, well, this is what my calendar looks like. I get it. Trust me, I get it. Um, but at the end of the day, that's where the intentionality comes into play. Um, now, there's several videos out about this, but it's going to be about picking your rocks. If you take the jar of life and say all of the primary things that I care a lot about are going to go into this jar together, the things that you pick first are going to fill up. And if you pick it with a bunch of little things, the busyness of life, the whirlwind, you're not going to have room for the things that are important. So pay attention to what you're selecting in your life and let the sand come in around it. So whether that's weekly reserving time or whether that's having a recurring thing constantly set aside for purpose of of building relationships, I highly, highly encourage you to do it because it could be make or break not only for your own happiness and connection with the people around you, but also for your business. That's it. Any questions? Susan Hughes, do you have a question? Nope, I was just applauding for you. Thank you. <laughs> so talk to us about the, the, the trust circle that you guys do in your small group. Since we have a little bit of time, I didn't see Carmen drop a timer in, so. Maybe you could share some of that with the team, with the group. Sure. Um, so what it is, we call them trust pods. Um, and we, we use the content from Stephen Covey's Speed of Trust. Great read. Um, it dives into actionable ways to work on building trust with people. And we've broken it down. So Stephen Covey has 13 trust behaviors and four cores of credibility that he brings up in his book. So we do a recurring 17-week program where we pick one and we pick a subject based on that. Because you get six people in a room, and you're like, hey, talk about trust. And they're just looking at you awkwardly like, um, what? So you give them leading, we give them leading questions of like, hey, what if you talk about this? Hey, what about this type of client situation? Talk about the nuances of this situation. Talk about how you'd approach this. And we have them form that conversation and often takes a left-hand turn and goes into something. But that's kind of the point. And then every week they get back together and they go to the next behavior and then the next one and the next one. And they'll circle back to the first one. And after they've been through it once or twice, you end up with this group that throughout the week, they'll be like, oh, this thing came up. And I think it's a trust related thing. And this is how I normally go about it. But I've heard different perspectives in this room that maybe that's not the way I want to go about it this time. And they bring that up to the room. And that's where it goes from something that's beneficial, to something that's really, really powerful. But again, the... A, a, a big part of it is is simply spend some time to be vulnerable with those people because that's that's where it all kind of that's where the heartbeat of it is. Nice, thank you. That goes into the heart of what Christina's talk earlier as well. 
just being authentic and vulnerable. And intertwined with everyone else, actually, like ADHD and being vulnerable and, and all that. Mm-hmm. Really loved it, you know, just be yourself. It matters. Yeah. Easier, said than, beautiful, the, beautiful easier said than done. <laughs> Yeah, than... Matthew, it, it took years for me to realize that I should just be as awkward as I want to be yeah, <laughs> in whatever room I'm in. It took me years, so, yeah, well, decades, so but anyway. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the first time I uttered, well, I'm having a good time and I'm enjoying this. So that's all I need. I was like liberated. It was fantastic. <laughs> I love that. Um, there's like a quote that I used to have up as my Zoom thing. And it's, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. Yeah. As a teacher, it's so true. And if I'm enjoying it, the kids are enjoying it. And if I'm not, it's just, eh. Yeah. Kids or adults, either way. My partner just got a uh, job as a teacher and he's learning that and he's like he, he's been telling me all of these stories about how it's just like because he's a sub so he would go around and help other teachers and he would see like some teachers interact very well have this amazing positive fun energy and the students were engaged they were laughing they were having a good time they were productive and then you saw the teacher that was just kind of frustrated didn't really know how to handle the students and it's just the frustration was coming across and that was frustrating the kids because they thought the teacher was mad at them you know when it was just he just didn't know what to do you know and and his frustration was coming out that way it's just yeah it's Definitely. Be yourself, have fun, and the kids know. They sense it. 